Madoka. My one and my only friend. Goodbye, Homura. Take care. I wouldn't go if I couldn't see you guys again. I know I don't have the courage to do something like that. In everything Homura does, there's one word we can always point to, Madoka. In the original timeline, before she was a magical girl, we're introduced to a shy and depressed Homura, one very obviously contrasted against the picture of perfection that was introduced nine episodes prior. Lacking any skills or confidence, she sees herself as useless. We don't get anything prior to this as with the other magical girls, however. Mommy made her wish to survive an accident, Kyoko to try and have a happy family by helping her father, Saika for Kiyosuke, who she'd known for a long time, and so on. For all of these magical girls, there's something in their backstory that helps to invoke their wish. Homura breaks from this case, making her wish because she has no backstory. She's introduced to us both in the past and present through Madoka, because that's where her story begins. Without Madoka, there simply is no Homura. Before this point, she considers herself a useless nobody. After being presented as unconfident alone in a week, she walks home, beginning to think to herself, I should just die. Now, a witch can influence the behavior of people as we see, but I think this is more of a case of a vulnerable target. Homer is someone susceptible to these thoughts, and this witch uses it to her advantage. The point of all of this, though, backed up by her lack of a backstory and her own view, is her life is worthless. I think that's why her lack of a story before she meets Monica can be crucial here. It needs to be painfully clear that she has nothing for one girl to become her everything. There's also some notes in the future as well, like her living alone. The anime is clear not to show Homura outside of the context of Monica, even if they're not together, it's a conversation about her. It's obvious she has nothing to live for until she does. Until the girl who showed her some kindness at school, the one actually interested in her and not her surface, now comes to her rescue as a magical girl. Within all of the darkness, there's now a light to keep moving towards. It's an excuse to break past the barrier of anxiety and awkwardness that may have held her back from the bubbly Madoka before, and in this moment, she latches on to the girl who saved her. I think this is the moment Homura meets Madoka. Yes, she does before, but this is the real Madoka, the one who fights evil and is willing to do anything to save others. Like how she saw past Homura's surface, Homura now sees what's beneath Madoka's. So you could say this is when she truly meets Madoka. Latched onto her, Homura has a purpose in life, even if it's just to be by her side. But I'm sure it's no secret that basing your entire being around someone else is a dangerous way to live, and in this case, deciding your being in a literal instant. This is a cornerstone of the anime as we explored with Sayaka, but she had years of backing to her decision, and I think this might be the distinction that makes that one tragic and dangerous, and our story for today become more world-changing. Now, humans are uncontrollable, irrational things, as the incubators muse time and time again. No matter how hard one tries, it's not possible to take someone and hold on to them forever. In the end, every connection is severed, whether by conflict or human nature, or by the inevitability of death. Homer's story is one of rejecting this fact. When Madoka dies to Valpurgis Noct, her wish is simply this. I wish I could meet Miss Kaname all over again, but this time, instead of her protecting me, I want to be strong enough to protect her! Think about that phrasing. She wants to return to the moment they met, the moment their connection started, giving them as much time as possible together once again. Her wish may be to save her and meet her again, but her desire is simply to always be with Monica. This is something that can never come true based on the facts of life we've discussed. No one can be together forever. This is exactly why I say her story is one of denial, because she circumvents a fact of life with her wish and her ability to manipulate time. Each new timeline is an attempt to ignore this fact by a different method, whether that's fighting alongside the others, trying to kill the incubator, making sure Madoka isn't involved at all, and so on. The most telling is probably her second rewind, where Sayaka becomes a witch and Mami kills Kyoko. With all of their friends dead, there's still just one thing on Homer's mind, keeping Madoka. Immediately after these brutal deaths, she swings back to that goal, even smiling. She smiles because no one else mattered. 
This timeline would be acceptable even with all the others dead. Even with both of them as witches. How about we both become witches? Then we can tear up this rotten world together. Only one thing matters. Not what, when, where, or why. Only who. Madoka. She even accepts that if they were witches destroying the world, that would be fine. That's not saving Madoka, that's simply being with her. She has no care for justice or defeating evil. Her fight, even when it's against the witches, is for one thing and one thing only. It just so happens that defeating Valpurgis Noct is what needs to be done for her one and only friend. Homer's personality changes as she repeats herself again and again, but that's about the only thing that does. Literally, as she's stopping anything from advancing, including herself. Because Homura is very literal with her wish, as each and every time she meets the series' namesake once again. I think this line from Sayaka is probably the best description of it. Running back into your own little time again, huh? That's a bad habit of yours. You count on that trick too much. Because she built herself entirely around someone else and keeps reverting to maintain that same goal, she never actually developed anything for her own sake. She knows one thing, and that's meeting Madoka, the thing she wished for. Homura has one singular action because her life is one singular thing. She never grew to love or appreciate anything else and never lets herself. Even the other people who show her kindness, like Mommy, she doesn't consider worthwhile. Even the ones who are Madoka's friends, she has nothing for. She wants nothing else. So it makes sense that she's willing to keep reliving the same hellish month again and again to maintain that singular aspect of her being. It's easier to keep doing what you know than to move on, especially when you gave up your soul so you didn't have to move on. However, the more and more she rewinds time to try and do this, the further and further her and her friend become, as she openly admits. She starts to more openly hurt Monica. She'll attack Kyubei, she'll insult Mommy, she'll even try to kill Madoka's other friends. It seems odd that given her obsession, she's hostile towards Madoka and her feelings, but I think this is simply a deepening of the obsession. Traveling back again and again, she witnesses constant failure, seeing Madoka be broken and beaten each time, turning into a more powerful witch each go around. When you have to execute your singular love before she turns into a monster, it's safe to say that probably breaks you a little bit. She simply wants to be with Madoka, whatever the cost and however unfriendly and painful it is, because that's slowly what's beaten into her. Once you execute your friend, is being mean something you're afraid of. To succeed, she may have to hurt her friend, but at least she doesn't have to kill her again. Everything becomes easier to justify, as the outcome of each timeline grows worse and worse. I don't want to fight, but you leave me no choice. If you make her suffer any more, then I will kill you right here right now now i've got you pain is fine if she can just be with her she even says after stealing part of madoka and rebellion my feelings for madoka they run so deep even pain has become precious to me but enough is enough when madoka removes the option of going back in time becoming the law of cycles and changing the very fabric of their world it removes the one singular thing Homura knew how to do. She does dedicate herself to fighting their new enemy, the Wraiths, and I think this fits for a moment as her substitute, because that's the most she can do for Monica. The Wraiths are the new evil of their world, now that magical girls are stopped before they can become witches. In that way, Monica's wish is one of fighting evil, by preventing the source of it, and also in allowing magical girls to continue fighting without becoming evil themselves. Both aspects help to reduce the evil in the world. So I think the core of Madoka and her wish is to fight evil. So Homer picks this up for some amount of time, but Rebellion opens on something much different than that, yet also very similar. As far as Homer's life is concerned, Madoka removing herself from reality is a complete destruction of it. There's really nothing left to live for. She reaches ultimate despair, the point where a magical girl becomes a witch. But whether it's good, evil, hope, despair, Homer isn't very creative. With the destructive power of a witch, she does the one thing she's always done, she meets Monica again. Unable to cope, she tricks herself, retreating into her own mind, she creates a copy of their world and invites the others to it, trapping them in her labyrinth where they can live a perfected version of their former lives. That's actually what I love about the first section of Rebellion. Before everything is obviously off, there's this creepy feeling that things aren't right. 
Like they're more flashy than ever transformations, the song about cake, the garden that's just so perfectly placed to overlook the city, and the fact that everything goes so well in a complete contrast to everything we've ever seen from this series so far. It all feels too perfect and too plastic. Despite it being her own trap, Homura is the one who starts to recognize this and undo it. And I love the questions she starts to ask. Like when Kyoko came to the city, where is she staying, and so on. They're the little questions that your imagination doesn't have to fill in when you get lost in a dream, the details that don't matter. She puts all of her attention into Madoka and her friends, the things tangential to her wish. The faces of other people, cities outside of their own, those are details that aren't necessary for a fantasy. And to me, that perfectly illustrates how we can't live in our imagination forever. It's too perfect in some ways, idealized where it needs to be, but so flawed in the others. As Sayaka, knowing the situation, says, You would have realized that if you stopped to think. Once she thinks about it, Homer figures out what's happening, that they're stuck in a labyrinth. She sees the cracks in places that don't hold her attention for creation, the things outside of Madoka, the city, the faces, Kyoko, and the other's attitudes, those give away part of the game. But her imagination could teach us things about her own wishes. When she starts to suspect it's not just a labyrinth, but her own, it's because of the details that matter to her, the things her mind would have spent its power and attention on, the things it wanted to make perfect. It's after she has a conversation with Monica about her dream, where Monica stopped existing, where she's explaining her own wish to her. Monica's response is that she could never leave her friends behind like that, even if she didn't have a choice. Now, someone who remembered Monica had to make this world, but that's not all. Someone who would make a world that would never require the kind of sacrifice that Monica made. Someone who would make a world that would create a Monica who could never leave her friends, no matter what. Someone who told the shy and unconfident Monica of episode 1, don't change ever. There's only one person so focused they can do that, to make a Monica so against Monica's own wish. She even recognizes this prior to their conversation, thinking to herself, Someone dragged us into this dream world. A coward who's turned her back on her responsibility to fight the wraiths. This farce is wasting the sacrifice Madoka made for us. This might be Madoka, but having passed her memories onto Sayaka and Bebe, she came into this world and was affected by its factors. She was made to be a static image of Madoka that would never leave for Homura's sake. We can look at another of their conversations to see the backing for this. If you hear in us talking like this, it feels like something I've wanted for a long time. Sitting here with you, it seems like something I've wanted for a long, long time. I think this perfectly positioned garden they somehow always end up in, with a perfect conversation about perfect friends, sums it up quite well. Homura tried too hard to make this world exactly what she wanted. This is where her imagination failed, and made something so perfect it couldn't be accepted. Because Monica's core is fighting evil, and she rejected staying with Homura to do this every single time. Now, all of a sudden, she wouldn't? It's too obviously her own trick. Homura recognizes from the time she was saved, and from the sacrifices Monica made, that Monica was one for the greater good. She was someone who would put herself in danger and lose everything to make the world better. This is the person who saved her, and the one she loves. This is why I made the distinction earlier that this is when they actually met, because Homura knows how selfless Monica is. It's what makes her who she is. The thing that kills her every time is fighting evil for those around her. Her destiny is to become the greater good itself and fight evil. This just isn't compatible with someone who's fine with becoming a witch if it means they're together. She can make a Monica that's willing to stay with her forever, but this isn't the one she loves. The one she loves is oddly the one who's able to reject her. She all but admits this before leaving their dream conversation, telling Monica that she's wrong. She's exactly the kind of person who would be brave enough to make that kind of decision, someone that grand and godly. And the anime isn't subtle at portraying Monica to be a deity in Homer's mind, as she literally worships at the base of a huge Monica. To be worshipped like this, she has to be perfect, but the one in this fake world is anything but perfect. The Monica she loves simply can't exist in her perfect little world. She can't exist with her, even in Homer's wildest imagination. This contradiction can't be overcome, that she loves the one who would leave her behind. And this cycle leads us to her decision to give into despair and destroy this dream world. Her imagination ran out, and it was time to accept her fate. 
to, in the summary of her own words, end the charade that made a mockery of Monica's wish. It's sadly fitting how she insults the person who made the labyrinth before realizing it was of her own doing. It feels very much like her first moments before she was saved, where she saw herself as useless. And that's exactly where she is once again, wanting to end her own life. Homer never grew or changed, so faced with no Monica, she returned to exactly where she was before her. But before she can, the incubators incur her wrath, revealing that they facilitated all of this so they could acquire the Law of Cycles for their own. They were essentially doing what Homer had failed to do, and in a way that went entirely against everything Monica had wished and sacrificed for. If there's one thing Homer gets somewhat right, it's that she respects the cost of her friend's wish, worshipping her as godly for such a dedication to that kind of act. It's overboard and obsessive, but it has its reason. This feeds her want to end her own life, to ensure that the incubators can't get their hands on Monica. She has to be able to exist wherever evil does to stop it, and this couldn't happen with their want to return to witches. It would make a mockery of the exact reason Monica left Homera. But in this, there's also a lesson and a realization for the worse. No one can criticize you for anything. I mean that. You're wrong. Everything has to do with her. I don't expect you to understand. No one in the world could possibly understand. The Incubators had a desire to rip God from the heavens, so she could no longer prevent great evil. This means that God can be manipulated with enough power, and also that God exists where there is evil. Something about Monica had always drawn her to the greatest source of evil. From the original season, this was Valpurgis Noct, that which was the common point of every timeline, no matter what happened before, she ended up there. That just fits with her character as well, as she's the kind of person to take on that force. And Homura, she's the kind of person who's drawn to becoming that kind of force. She's already admitted she would become evil if that meant having her friend. This is their incompatibility, one that is capable of great power for the sake of all, and the other for the sake of one. This is rebellion. Homer and Monica are quite aptly described as opposites of sorts, one as a god and one as a demon, once Homer decides to rewrite the world for her benefit. She recognizes everything we've covered and uses the incubator's plan for herself. If God requires evil to exist and God's purpose is to defeat that evil, then isn't there something that can always exist alongside God by definition? This is a world which relies on karma and cycles. There can't be one state without the other by its own rules. Madoka is one of those states, so Homura makes herself the other. I'm an existence called evil now, and if evil is supposed to disrupt the divine, it's only natural for me to upset the laws of a god. The only way opposites can coexist is within this karmic balance. After mentally destroying herself for so long, Homer only wants to exist with Monica, the perfect Monica who saved her, the one that couldn't exist in her labyrinth, the one who could reject her. It doesn't matter how or why, just that it is happening and that it is the true Monica. Her treatment of her in the original season makes this clear, as she's not even attempting to be friendly. Pain was fine if it meant they were together. Evil was fine if it meant they were together. So what's the difference if she becomes the evil the god fights? This means the god has no option but to be with her for as long as they both exist. She's even comfortable admitting that, Well then, I suppose one day you will also be my enemy. I think that when faced with ultimate despair, she made this decision. Because in that moment, when she became a witch, and by definition, the most evil a magical girl can become, was when she got to see Madoka one more time. Her evil is what brought her love back to her. She has the only incentive she'd ever need to become pure evil. Her darkness is what drew the light back in. The method had never mattered, just the outcome. Evil and good are subjective terms relative to love, at least in her world. Why would she care about anything like that when she found the solution, the way to witness the perfect Madoka until the end of time? And although I believe this is wholeheartedly backed up by what we see in the series and the movie, I think it's also in what we hear. Homer's songs in Rebellion are different from before. They went from these slower, darker themes like this. <laughs> to something brighter and happier, but still faded and a bit haunting and insane like this. It's something that screams an insanity, I'm the villain and I don't care, I got what I wanted. 
and in these final moments, her obsession and lack of creativity shines through as always. She rewrote the world, but look at what she does with it. They're in the same school, she copies the exact things Monica did and said when they met, she has their conversation in the same spot, all of it. Given this chance, she does what she's always known and meets Monica again. I think that's why it's plausible she simply took the idea from the incubators because she has no originality, only able to try and recreate what she considered to be the ideal time of her life. Especially as she takes Monica's ribbons at her place, this time being the one welcoming a new student. Even with infinite power, she couldn't come up with anything other than what she'd witnessed from Monica. And even with what she does with infinite power, it's just what she saw Monica do in rewriting the world. She was the one who witnessed that the first time around as she explains to the incubators. She's just doing what she knew again. She is obsession and her object is Monica. Nothing new can be created and nothing can exist outside of that obsession. And I think that's all I can say about Homer's character. It feels like I could have come out at the start of this video, said the word Monica, and cut it right there, having accurately displayed what she's all about. All of her actions and everything she does is simply centered around holding on to Monica, and that's what she does in the end, in ripping her from the heavens. She simply increases the intensity as time goes along. I do think there are some interesting things to be said, especially about escaping into her own imagination and the fact that she couldn't fool herself, uh, that she knew Monica was perfect, but that a perfect Monica wouldn't have her, and then becoming evil to reconcile that. And those are things I realized after writing and rewriting this script many times, uh, and bang, <laughs> not literally, but figuratively banging my head against the wall that is Rebellion and its somewhat convoluted plot that muddied the waters a bit, but I think there is something to be understood in Homer through this, and I hope I was able to present it well today. But I'll stop myself from rambling about my lack of confidence and my love of Monica Magica and go into my usual plugs at the end of the video, so just give me one more minute of your time here real quick. Uh, the, I'll have a link to my Twitter in the pinned comment, which will where I'll post rants about anime like I did with this very topic a few weeks ago by the time you're seeing this, as well as announcements for new videos, my Discord where you can chill and hang out, talk about anime, videos I post, we have a quiz bot, we got some live reactions to people watching series, which was a cool thing, my Twitch where we stream on Thursday nights and Saturday evenings in Eastern Time, uh, so we're playing some games, talking anime, some cool community things over there, but most importantly out of those links I'll have one to my Patreon where you can get your name at the end of videos like this cool people above me, these cool people above me, and support the channel directly, and once we get enough people over there we'll start doing some extra things uh, for those patrons as well. But anyway, thank you for the last minute, and I'll just say thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you again soon. <laughs>